So I caught you in the jet lag or you think you're past that? I think I'm good now. All right, let's go. We'll, we'll, we'll see how we do later in the conversation. Okay. Hi, I'm Peter Barrett. I'm co-founder and general partner at Playground Global, a deep tech venture firm in Palo Alto, California. Hi, I'm Krishan Srinivasan. I'm technology leader at Maersk. I'm part of a team where we manage all of technology infrastructure for Maersk, everything from uh, network to compute to cloud to software and enterprise architecture as well. Uh, fun fact, I gave Elon Musk his first job in Silicon Valley. Fun fact, I did not give Elon Musk his first job. Uh, however, I started traveling at the age of 12. I've been to all of Southeast Asia and US, uh, so uh, that's something that I'm really proud of. I had him writing uh, video game drivers uh, on, on a PC. He actually is reasonably good at writing software. Uh, my favorite place, I would say, is Hong Kong is on top of the list. You want to start? Sure. OK, go for it. You think? So let's start with uh, what will be the next generation of AI look like? like what uh, you know, you've been in this field, you work with a lot of startup companies, uh, investing in a lot of uh, AI stuff. What is what is your crystal ball saying? I think that we are entering a very rapid phase of evolution of AI, and while the ChatGPT and ChatGPT4 and their kin have really demonstrated these things can now do extraordinary and useful things, uh, I still think we have a lot of work to do on reasoning and veracity yeah. and remembering and forgetting and, and those things that actually make the intelligences uh, even more useful. Uh, but there is some serious concern in terms of uh, what is going to do the existence of humans and will AI even get smarter than humans and will it rule the world and uh, what, what's, what's kind of your view? Well, I think AI is smarter than humans in lots of ways yeah. already, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the anti-lock braking is smarter than humans at applying brakes and yeah. has been for, for decades. Uh, so I think we've got a, you know, there is this sort of existential angst about artificial general intelligence awakening one day and turning us into paper clips. I don't think that scenario is imminent or likely. Uh, I do think that while the change in capabilities of the ChatGPT stuff seems to have happened overnight. Those models have been progressing uh, for, for many, many years, and it's only that they are accessible through a, you know, a UI and an API that anybody can use that makes it feel like it's happened overnight. Yeah. Uh, but we do need to be aware that every, uh, every new tool we have has dual use and that in the wrong hands, these tools can be powerful amplifiers Absolutely. of things that we don't want to have happen. Yeah. Can I put two in at once? No. Sorry. No, I, I, I think this is where the jet lag is coming in for you. Do you think this is something that can be controlled through either registration or um, global standards or? Yeah, and I think, I, I think there are basically sensible things you can do. Like for example, if I'm talking to somebody on a telephone, that if that's an AI, it should dis disclose to me that it's an AI. Sure. Because we're at that point now where it's very difficult to tell. So uh, I know you and I talked about this last time. And by the way, this is just my personal view. Uh, so when you look at the stack today, uh, you got the um, you got the data stack. You got the application stack, and you got the consumers on the third stack. I, I, I'm just like yep. abstracting the whole stack. My theory is that with next-gen AI, the middle stack kind of shrinks completely. Uh, you no longer need, in the future, uh, people writing these full-stack applications because now you have ways and means to access the data directly through AI, but this heavy lifting of writing the full stack on the middle part kind of shrinks and goes away. No, look, I think that's absolutely right. And I think much of the code that's written today are clumsy, very narrow things to explore what is an improbably large amount of data, uh, and those explicit methods will go away, right? And these implicit methods of having these models that um, you can ask what have been up until now fairly impossible questions and get the right answer uh, is, really, is really exciting. 
We had this long conversation. Sorry, you got yeah. this? Yeah. Ah, I think <laughs> you did it. Uh, not that far behind, I guess. Yeah. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, we are, I would say, in, in early phases of adoption. Uh, uh, one example I could give you is uh, what we've done with our APMT terminals. So roughly we have about 65-ish terminals spread out globally, and these are big ports. Um, and about 30,000 vessels, some dock into these, uh, uh, into these ports a year. Roughly about 60 million containers have to be picked up and dropped. So you can very quickly think about the scale of the problem and then in which you need to orchestrate it. Uh, you need to make sure there's no backlog and if one process stops and hinders, the whole thing backs uh, and you've got ships right. backing up and creates a massive issue. Um, and typically in past, what our teams used to do is uh, you do kind of the pre-planning. So if I know a ship is going to show up in this port, be it LA or something, a day and a half before we, the planning process starts. And they say, okay, the ship is going to has X number of containers. We have Y number of trucks. How do we sequencing and what order? And what are the permutation and combination that needs to happen? And that was all done in spreadsheets. Uh, yeah. So you can imagine how, uh, how complex this, the whole work is. And with AI, what our teams have done in, in APMT uh, is they have now uh, created a digital twin of the entire port. So now we can actually do water simulations. Huh? Uh, and it's basically, it's so super cool. Uh, in terms of, okay, how do I now automate the process? What should the sequencing be? What is the most efficient sequencing? And even from a safety standpoint, and we take safety super serious uh, for us as a company. So if putting all those parameters into play, we have now built a digital twin uh, with AI, and that can tell us exactly what needs to be done. So it's been pretty successful. Now we are kind of rolling it out uh, globally as well. All right, Peter, you got a question on you? Oh. What does the future of computing look like? I truly believe that uh, edge computing is, is, is underplayed. So I'll give you a quick, couple of quick examples. We have almost 700 vessels. Um, and each of these vessels, we have to be uh, quite thoughtful in the amount of data we stream because of the network bandwidth limitation that they're sitting in you know, middle part of some ocean. And so how do you have a rich um, experience for our colleagues and employees within the ship? How do you make uh, decisions? Uh, how do you run late, uh, lightweight uh, computer vision use cases? We have this platform called Star Connect, and it uh, collects information from almost like it, about 2.5 billion data points from all the IoT devices within the ship and, and weather forecasts and all that. And then it transmits back information to the vessel to say how fast or how slow you should go. So that then helps us from a carbon emission standpoint you know, yeah. on, on many things, right? So fuel uh, savings and things like that. So to me, I think that's the power of edge computing, is, is where I think the next-gen computing is going to go. As we have more and more intelligence at the edge and devices that are creating huge amounts mm. of data, you, you're going to have to deal with that data mm. at the edge, yeah. right? That, uh, uh, you know, we have a company that's building a next-generation um, sequencer that can do very inexpensive human genomes, um, if they deploy at the rate they expect to, you'll be generating a YouTube data, a YouTube worth of data every <laughs> week. And so it's those kinds of things. They need to do the bioinformatics at the yeah. edge, right? You can't send it up to AWS and yeah. grind on it with, with GPUs. The machines we have today can do extraordinary things, but can't do useful things, okay. right? So uh, we can do mathematical, we can sample out of the quantum space that would be hard to, or impossible to do with a classical machine. Um, but we are close to building machines that are incredibly useful. How is the way we are working with robots evolving? From a more standpoint, we have a view, which is we believe that uh, ro robotics is not a revolution, it's more an evolution. And our theory is always, that at least the going and assumption, it's, it's going to be complementary to, uh, to our workforce, uh, uh, be it on the warehouse side, uh, where if we think that there's something is too heavy for a human to be uh, lifting from a safety standpoint, we think robots can play a big role, uh, be it picking and packing, uh, rather than a human having to walk all the way and there is human error involved and picking the right thing. So picking things in a warehouse, we believe robots, has, it's already started. We're already doing that today. So when we started Playground, there was a recognition that AI was going to change the world, 
but an AI without sensing an actuation, without being able to reach out and touch the world and sense the world directly, um, without sensing an actuation, it's a brain in a jar, yeah. right? And yeah. not that useful. So we've, from the earliest days, we have invested in robotics that connect those AIs to real physical jobs, right? And real utility. And they can take the form of, you know, abstract things like um, robotic farming um, technologies, right? That can uh, weed and, and plant and operate a farm without, without pesticides. But there are other kinds of robotics that are centrally focused around amplifying people, not replacing mm -hmm. them. Because there are things that robots can't do, right? Sure. Beyond the intelligence, they don't have the physical dexterity mm. that we do, that they don't have, you know, they're pretty, e even if you connect them to chat GPT, which, yeah. we, which we have, they're dumb as a bag of nails, right? And, you, and, and they can't uh, handle exceptions. Yeah, right? they, the, the challenge is programming them to do a task yeah. in a way that There's generalizes. There's too many permutations and, of, yeah. And look, AI will have a significant, um, role to play in that and you'll the robots will be able to watch somebody do a job and then sure. take over the jo job themselves but humans are capable of feats of perception planning and dexterity that robots mm. uh, aren't going to do anytime soon and you know there's this uh, you, you may have come across the uh, Moravec paradox of it's pretty easy to get robots to do something useful but picking up something like this and placing it is it yeah. my go? I think it's your turn. Go okay. Uh, this n none of this looks very favorable yeah. at the moment. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not. Uh, you're not a robot today. Yeah. This is a, yeah. So robots could crush this. <laughs> yeah, like you never. But but they would know exactly the right place to put it. Yeah. But they couldn't pick the chip up. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, you look at the the rate of in, increase in computation and and um, you know visual perception and ChatGPT and compare it to the grippers from 30 or 40 years ago, we just haven't made mm. much progress. All right, let's do some uh, counting over here. Oh, I think it's going to be grim. <laughs> um. I think I have this one, six, and you have four. Okay. So that's one, four, one, Oh, no, six. I have three fours. I got a diagonal two. Yeah, you got one, too. Yeah, but I think you get more points for the really long ones. Yeah. The pleasure to have you, Peter. Thanks. Uh, and high five for the game as well. <laughs> uh, and uh, lovely to have you here today and spend time with us and in uh, the beautiful Copenhagen as well. Yeah.